Bittersweetness is a view of the world and a way of being in the world. It's a way to connection. It's a way to transcendence. You're very attuned to the gap between the world as it is and the world as we would wish it to be. You can take those pains and sit with them somehow and then make meaning out of them. Here's a question for you. Are you one of those people that finds solace, that finds comfort in things like rainy days or melancholy music? If you know what I'm talking about, that feeling isn't really a feeling of sadness. It's more like this feeling of longing, like this beautiful ache, this ache that actually makes you feel more connected to the human experience. So what is that experience exactly? Well, today's guest, a former corporate lawyer turned author, wondered the same thing. And so she went on like this seven year journey to better understand it. The result of which is Bittersweet, her number one New York Times bestselling book that ponders this quiet state of being and why embracing it paves a true path to things like creativity, deeper connection, and ultimately transcendence. I think you could say that quiet states of being are Susan Cain's thing. They are her specialty because her first book was literally entitled Quiet, Quiet, the Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. That book spent eight years on the New York Times bestseller list. Her writing has appeared everywhere. Her TED Talks on the power of introverts and this idea of bittersweetness have been viewed over 40 million times. And today she's here and no surprise, we go deep on both these things, introversion and bittersweetness, which I think we can agree are both states that culture doesn't do a great job of encouraging. And yet both are, are very powerful when recognized and when nourished as these vehicles for acceptance and for meaning and for connection. So here we go. Please hit that subscribe button and enjoy me trying to hide just how nervous I was and a bit intimidated I was talking to Susan Cain. I was thinking about you the other day because I got invited to attend this conference down in San Diego. Um, and uh, I was looking forward to it. Like, oh, I get to actually just relax and be an attendee as opposed to getting on stage, yeah. which is very, to this day, anxiety producing in me. And then at the last minute, um, it was being put on by Sanjay Gupta at CNN and mm -hmm. he, he texts me and he's like, oh, by the way, I think it'd be great if you did like a fireside chat with Lance Armstrong, like on Thursday or whatever. And, uh -huh. and I immediately went from like thinking this was a little bit of a mini vacation. Yeah, to totally. Suddenly like, <laughs> oh my God, how am I gonna do this? Like tormenting myself and being tortured over the, over the whole thing. Because no matter how many times I've graced a stage, it still feels very unnatural to me and is still very anxiety producing. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, it's like, I mean, you, you you probably know I used to have this huge public speaking sure. phobia. So for me, it used to be like, you know, a completely destabilizing event. So I'm totally past that now. Like that's overcome. Mm -hmm. But I still completely relate to what you just said. Like if I'm in the audience and going to the conference, it's like, la la. Um, right. But it, waking up in the morning when I have to be the one on stage, it's just like, that's not a chill morning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the occasion of this conversation is your your latest book, Bittersweet, but I do wanna spend a little bit of time on the introversion sure. subject matter. Yeah. Um, because I relate to it so deeply as somebody who has come into an awareness of being, um, you know, an introvert or on the introversion side of that spectrum. Yeah, yeah. But somebody who can uh, emulate the extrovert for short bursts or periods of time, mm -hmm. but always has to retreat to, you know, charge the battery back right. up. Right, like yeah, it comes we should definitely talk about that. Yeah, so, oh yeah, no, I get it completely. Yeah, so I'm just, I'm interested in how you, it, it, you know, it's so interwoven with this, the public speaking thing too. Which it is so is interwoven. Yeah, I think for many, well, not for every introvert, because there are introverts who are totally comfortable with public speaking. It's like some small mm. subset of them feel that way, but for most people, they more describe what you just did. Yeah, but even extroverts probably fear it on some level. Is that the case? Oh, from, lots of extroverts mm, fear it. Yeah, I mean, it's like the number one fear. So there's tons of extroverts who are yeah. terrified of speaking. Yeah, and yeah. you know, what's interesting about your work 
Um, you know, when we talk about quiet and introversion, which is a subset of the population, albeit a larger one than I think we previously realized, bittersweet uh, speaks to something that's universal in all of us, not mm -hmm. just to that subset, but on some level to everybody. But I think what unites these books or one thing that unites them is, is that um, they both are this call to elevate something that society undervalues or doesn't quite understand and often or or you know to our detriment squashes out of us. Yeah. And yeah. so that's kind of a, you know this universality theme that permeates your books. Like how does that like what is that sensibility? Like how did you come into that? I'm interested in like how you chose this subject matter and and why this has become, you know, your your calling. Yeah, absolutely. We can talk about that. Um I, I think about it also, it's exactly what you just said, like hidden superpowers. Um and it's also about a different way of being in the world from the one that is celebrated, you know, in mm -hmm. the media and celebrity culture and all of it, um, in our work culture. I, I would say both of the books are about a different way of being in the world. Yeah. I mean, I'm just interested in, in the genesis of all of this for you. I know it's interwoven with public speaking and maybe we can begin with the introversion question like, this appreciation of introversion in yourself and this kind of quest or desire to dig deeper into what that means and how uh, what you discovered could be healing to the many, many people who are introverts and feel out of step with cultural expectations or a sense of who they feel like they should be or could be. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know where this comes from in me, but I, I would say, when I wrote Quiet and when I wrote Bittersweet, I thought that I was writing two really different books. Mm -hmm. um, but now when I look at them, they they both have to do with the way in which um, society has su and cu culture has such a specific and really rather narrow expectation of the way that we're supposed to be in the world. Um, and so both books are talking about a different way of being and one that is quite powerful or ways that are quite powerful in their own right, um, but that don't get celebrated. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and kids from a very young age, like in the case of introversion are, are taught, you should be, you know, out there, you should be dominant, you should be um, loud, you should be take charge, you know, this, this whole constellation of qualities, um, which are wonderful, but there's another way of being that describes a third to a half of the population and that brings with it delights and powers of its own. And it just felt to me like, you know, a colossal mm -hmm. waste of talent and energy and happiness to be telling half up to half the population that you want to be, that who you are isn't okay and you mm -hmm. should be turning yourself in, into a pretzel to be some other way. Right, right. And and so how do you define that? Like how, what is your definition of introversion? And I suppose the follow-up question to that is like, how does that differentiate from someone who is shy or somebody who is insecure or has some kind of social anxiety? Yeah, so introversion is about, I mean, there's a kind of popular definition, which I think works really well of like, where do you get your energy from? Mm -hmm. You know, and a, a really easy way to think of it is, to imagine that you're at a party and you've been there for about two hours and it's with company you're truly enjoying and you're having a good time. Um, but still, you know, the extrovert at the party, their battery is, is charging up and now they want more. Mm -hmm. Whereas an introvert's battery is probably draining no matter how good a time they're having. And so there comes that moment where you just wish you could beam yourself home and be yeah. someplace else. And... Um, and so it really is this question of like, you know, how much, how much stimulation do you need in order to feel in a state of peace and equilibrium? You know, and for introverts, they get very quickly to a place of too much. Mm -hmm. And for an extrovert, you get very quickly to a place of too little. You know, like if things are too quiet, not mm -hmm. enough is happening, you feel like, you know, I better call a friend, I better do something. Right. Um, and all of that is quite different from shyness, which is more about the fear of social judgment, you know, and like um, a shy person looks at, has an interaction with someone who might have a neutral expression on their face and they'll tend to read disapproval into the neutrality and then be very upset about the, the disapproval. Mm -hmm. so, um, 
so it's a quite different state. Like you could be an introvert right. and not be shy or vice versa. Um, but my work, I would say, focuses on both, both ways of being, because both ways of being show up very similarly in terms of behavior. And so they get judged in similar ways. Right, right. Yeah. And and shyness being something that is mutable, but perhaps introversion or extroversion is more fundamental or constitution. Like, is there a mutability to it? Yeah, I don't know if I'd say that one is more mutable than the other. Um, I would say in both cases, there are temperaments that people are born with that predispose you in one direction or another. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then layered over the temperament, you have all kinds of life experiences and skills that you gain. And, you know, it's all a big mishmash. But um, but there, there are babies who are born um, into this world. And from the day they're born, you can test their nervous systems and see that they're more reactive to all different kinds of stimulation. Like mm-hmm. they'll they'll salivate more if you give them sugar water and put it in their mouths. And so the babies who salivate more when they're two years old and you put them into a play group of kids they've never met before, those are the babies who are gonna tense up and, and take longer to integrate into the group because they basically have a nervous system that is just reacting more mm-hmm. to new inputs and it makes you wanna like slow things down and pause and check right. it all out before you're ready. Is that like, when I think about that, the, the word that comes to mind is sensitivity, right? Which is applicable to, to bittersweetness too. Like I took, yeah. the, the, I took your quiz, yeah. I scored a 7.3. <laughs> so I guess I'm I, prone to some level of bittersweetness, but I've always thought of myself as maybe just a little bit more sensitive than certain other people. And sensitivity could be a word that you could apply to introversion as well. Like they're just more sensitized to their environment or I mean, how do you, like, is that a completely different way of thinking about this or how does that No, it's more up? like these are all really overlapping categories. They don't lay totally on top of each other, but they overlap. So with bittersweetness, um, which by the way, I define as a kind of a state of mind where you're very attuned to the way in which joy and sorrow in this world are forever paired. You know, you mm-hmm. don't get one without the other in, in this life. Um, and the way in which everyone and everything we love will not be here forever, but that somehow what comes with that knowledge, there comes a kind of deep joy at the beauty of the world. So it's a it's it's mm-hmm. a like a real blend of all these um, deep instincts. And what we found, we we have a bittersweet quiz. I say we because I developed it with Scott Barry Kaufman. Right. Who I know you know. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm seeing him on Friday night. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. He actually. It was, was inviting me to come, but I'll be Aww. back home by then. Um, so Scott Barry Kaufman and I, and David Yaden, who's at Johns Hopkins, uh, we developed this quiz to measure how bittersweet you are. And what we found is that the people who score high on the quiz, like you, also score high on this trait of high sensitivity mm-hmm. that you're talking about kind of instinctively. And that trait is basically like the kind of person who just reacts much more intensely to everything, you know, like if you see the beauty of the, the these canyons out here, like you're gonna really love it. Um, and if there were suddenly a loud and terrible noise, it would probably bother you that much more. Um, but, and so many introverts are highly sensitive, but not all of them. So mm. we actually didn't find that there's any correlation between bittersweetness and introversion. That's The correlation is with sensitivity. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Cause you would yeah. think that they would toggle together. Well, it's like about 80% of highly sensitive people are introverts, but you could be highly sensitive and be extroverted also. Right. And then you could be introverted and not be sensitive. Right. So that's why I say these are like overlapping yeah, yeah, categories. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in how we arrived at this moment in our culture, and you've written about this, where I wouldn't say we pathologize introversion, but we certainly don't, we don't like, socially select for it, right? Where introverts are sort of thought of as the people who are gonna have a harder time in the workplace achieving. They tend to have more difficulty getting their ideas across because of the constructs that we've created around education and 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 professional careers. Mm-hmm. And you've written extensively about like how we've gotten to this point and how we might rethink these cultural mores or priorities to better understand not just 
this dynamic between introversion and extroversion, but also like how to leverage the beautiful talents of the introverts so that they can thrive because just like extroverts, they can become leaders and they're often the people with the most interesting, creative, forward-thinking ideas. Yeah, and so there's this real mismatch. I mean, when, when you look at who have been many of the most creative people over time, I mean, like psychologists have studied this and you usually find people who are quite introverted or at least to some degree introverted because solitude is such a key ingredient of creativity, which is not something that ever gets talked about, mm -hmm. but it's true. Um, yeah, and for me, you know, I am... Um, I think I was just aware of this mismatch from a really early age because I come from a family of introverts. Like, I don't think we have a single extrovert in my family of origin. And it was just really plain to me that the different things that my family members were doing in the world, things that I admired, were so related to their kind of quiet and cerebral way of being. You know, like I, I had a father who... Um, he was a doctor and a medical school professor, and he was amazing at what he did. And he was the one you'd go to if you couldn't figure out the diagnosis, he mm -hmm. might be able to figure it out. And, and he was also somebody who would go to work these long hours, and then he would come home after work and pour over medical journals um, and like go to the medical conferences and sit in the front row and tape everything and listen yeah. to it over and over again until he'd figured it out. And it, it was things like that, this that I kept seeing in real life and then many of the artists I admired and writers I admired, so just like people out in the world were so clearly contributing, not in spite of, but because of their quieter way of being. And yet, as you're saying, in our mm -hmm. schools and in our workplaces, it's not thought of that way. Right. And so what is the solution for that? I know you've you've done a lot of work around like reorienting the workplace and trying to find ways where we can, you know, foster, you know, that type of energy mm -hmm. and, and bring it to the surface and in, in a way where it is respected. Yeah. Better. I mean, I do think as with everything that raising awareness is, is the hugest step of all. And it's actually been amazing to see how over the last 10 years, how much more awareness there is and how much of a shift in orientation um, there is, you know, mm -hmm. so there are lots of workplaces that are like thinking about this in really conscious terms and um, they have working groups formed around it. And, you know, they're thinking through different ways of hiring and promotion and that kind of thing. Um, and you also see schools doing things like, um, like rethinking the way kids are giving, given feedback, you know, because so many kids are told, um, you know, like Sophie is doing great in class, is doing great academically, but she must learn to speak up more in class. Mm -hmm. And getting that feedback compared to Sophie is a deep thinker. And when she contributes, every, everybody turns around to listen because, because she has so many in, interesting insights to add. Right. That feels completely different to Sophie. And I've gotten a lot of letters from so the Sophies of the world telling me of how painful it is to them when they get the first type of feedback. Right. You know, they feel like their teachers don't respect them at all. So I am seeing those kinds of changes. We are seeing those kinds of changes. And that's really gratifying, even though I think we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just know but, for myself, when I think about open plan, open yeah. floor plan workplaces or, you know, co-working place, like that just, that sounds terrible to me. Like I want a womb. I want to shut the door. <laughs> yeah. I don't want any windows. I don't want anybody to ever knock on that door or for the phone to ring. Like my great ambition is to be left alone. And when I can inhabit that place, I then can do the work that I feel compelled to do, my best work. Um, but anything that involves collisions or like inner is like, just sounds like a nightmare to me. And when I see that trend of like these open floor plans, like that doesn't seem conducive to the introvert, like being, able to express themselves optimally. Oh my God, yes. Yeah. And in fact, I discovered this because, um, well, you know, like you, I used to be a corporate lawyer. So uh -huh. I had come from this world, I assume your firm was like this, where, you know, everyone had their own little office. And yeah. It was almost like a dorm room or, or a do dormitory right. with everybody in their, their office. So I kind of thought that's what work looked like. And then I started researching quiet. So I decided I was going to like plop down in Silicon Valley for a while because I figured there would be many introverts there. Mm -hmm. And I was expecting this kind of introvert 
Nirvana. And I got there, and all these people who I was interviewing, they're all coming up to me and kind of whispering, like, this open office plan that I'm in is a disaster, and I can't concentrate. Like, right. all, everything that you just said. Just everything's overwhelming. Everything's overwhelming. Yeah. And they were like, I can't tell my boss. This is why they're whispering. They're like, I can't tell my boss, because if my boss heard me saying this, they would think I'm not a team player. They think I don't like my colleagues. And it's not that. It's just it's everything you just said you mm-hmm. know, about the, the best way that they would feel of, would focus and be in a state of equilibrium would be in private environments. So, so they start asking me, like, is there research that I could show my boss to just let them rethink this a little bit? And I started looking. And, and this was already, this was like a long time ago. But even by then, there was a lot of research. There was a mountain of research showing all the problems with these open office plans, specifically for introverts, but really for everyone. You know, focus goes mm-hmm. down, people get more sick, all this stuff. So fast forward, I would say now people are starting to understand how problematic that kind of floor plan is. Um, and especially now in the wake of the pandemic, there is a kind of rethinking going right. on. Right. But where we end up remains to be seen because it's also much more cost efficient to have everybody crammed into sure, one big of space. Course. So um, the pandemic must have provided you with a lot of data on this. Like on one level, it's sort of nirvana for the introvert who now can be ensconced in their own home mm-hmm. and can sort of control their environments a little bit better. But then over time, maybe not so good. Like what have you learned about the pandemic in terms of the introversion, extroversion thing in the workplace, et cetera. It's a little bit of a mixed bag because, uh, you know, as, as you're suggesting, for there's a way in which, especially during kind of peak lockdown, there's a way in which it was much easier for your typical introvert than for your typical extrovert. Um, but, but all the uncertainty that was involved and the disruption isn't easy for anyone. Mm-hmm. And introverts in general have, are less comfortable with uncertainty than extroverts are. So it, I, I would say it took a toll in different kinds of ways. Mm. But what I really saw is that, excuse me, especially at that moment, it was it was really a fantastic time, regardless of who you were, to take stock, or regardless of your temperament, to take stock of whether your previous life had been working for you or not. You know, because I yeah. I knew many extroverts who were telling me, you know what, even for me, I was going to 24 seven and now I realize that I want to pull this back. Um, and then there were introverts who were saying, <laughs> this is fantastic and I love not having to mm-hmm. go to the office all the time and I have to rework my life to, to, to preserve some of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, we're going to be learning about this for years to come. Like we're still kind of in it mm-hmm. and we don't necessarily have the the ten thousand foot view on the long term impact of this, but right. you know it's been hard for everybody. It's been very hard on you and your family. I know that, and must have been excruciating for you while writing this book on bittersweetness to you know kind of endure loss in your own family. Yeah, you know that was an interesting thing because people assume that I wrote bittersweet like in response to the disruptions and the losses of the pandemic. But, you know, because as you say, I I lost my brother first and then my father Mm -hmm. um, to COVID. But I was actually working on this book for years before that. You know, that is my way. I I work on things for a really long time. So, I don't know. What's interesting to me about that is I, I see the world as bittersweet all the time, and I'm like, mm-hmm. regardless of what's going on, you know. So when it's a pandemic, it's not surprising to me. And the epigraph of the book comes from the Leonard Cohen quote of um, "There's a crack in everything, and that's where the light gets in." So because of seeing the world that way, it means when when we're in difficult times, I'm also more apt to be looking for what the the light side is. Mm-hmm. Just as when we're in good times, I'm like. Come on, you guys, don't you realize everything's not as perfect as you think? Yeah. There, there's also all this loss and fragility going on at every moment. Um, it, it's, it's a kind of worldview where you're seeing it all constantly. 
Well, it's a non-binary, non-dualistic approach, yeah. right? It's a very yeah. holistic approach to how emotions operate. And you can't have one without the other. And mm -hmm. this is a soup. And the more that we can appreciate that one doesn't happen without the other, the more kind of space there is for, for healing and kind of understanding the beauty and the power of leaning into these emotions rather than avoiding them because we're constantly being signaled to just be happy or pursue happiness at all times, at all costs. Right, right. Um, yeah, and in fact, I uh, I gave a talk about bittersweetness at TED the summer before the pandemic hit. So it was the summer of 2019. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting because I felt like there were half the people, like when I came off stage and I knew a whole bunch of people in the audience and half of them were like, oh my gosh, this is totally me and I totally understand what you're talking about. And then some of them were like, oh, I didn't know that you were depressive. And I was like, no, that's actually not what I'm saying mm -hmm. at all. Um, and in, and that's part of what the problem, I think, with that our culture, part of the problem that our culture has is that we don't have a way of distinguishing between you know, clinical depression, which I would never recommend to anybody, versus this way of being that, takes it all in, um, the good and the bad, and is just aware of it all. Right, it's very telling that somebody would just leap to that yeah, and associate yeah. those two things as being the same and pathologizing it, right? Oh my, I'm sorry, something's wrong with you, as opposed to this is life. And of course we aspire to live happy lives, but that happiness is informed by the you know inevitable obstacles and painful moments that, that descend upon all of us. and the manner in which we're able to kind of embrace those moments, learn from them, lean into them, I think enriches the happier moments because that's truly how you appreciate life rather than running away from those other things and repressing them and trying to dodge them. Yeah, and the, there, there's this whole, like if you look at all our wisdom traditions and our literary and artistic heritage heritages across the world, across the centuries, like they have been teaching all this time that this is a way in that mm -hmm. that appreci that appreciating this side of existence you know the bittersweet side of existence is a way to creativity it's a way to connection it's a way to transcendence um and the, the way that i got into this whole inquiry in the first place is because all my life i had had this really intense reaction to sad music um but by intense i don't mean intensely sad i mean like I'd hear this music and feel completely uplifted. Um, so there's this one moment I was in law school and some friends were, were picking me up in my law school dorm mm -hmm. on the way to class. And I was blasting Leonard Cohen or something um, as I am wont to do. And, and my friends came by and they, were, they thought it was hilarious. And they were like, why are you listening to this funeral music? And at the time I just laughed and went to class and that was the end of the story. But I couldn't stop thinking about it because it was like, well, what is it in our culture that makes it so odd to listen to this music? But even more, what is it that the music is telling us? Um, there's something in it. I mean, we, we, we know that sad music is much more likely to produce like goosebumps and mm -hmm. chills and listeners. People listen to the happy songs on their playlists 175 times, but they listen to the sad songs 800 times. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's something there's somewhere that that music is pulling us, of like that the musician is telling you that thing that you felt, you know, that pain that you've sometimes felt. I, the musician, have been there too, and everybody listening to this has been there too, and we are all connected in this same strange state of being human. And that's where the feelings of uplift and love come from. Right, and connection, of course. And like connection. You feel like you're seen and you're being, you're being heard. There is somebody else there through a musical note can identify very specifically an emotion that you're experiencing and suddenly you don't feel alone anymore. Yeah, exactly. And that's a joyful experience, even if it's one that also is kind of about sorrow and pain and grief. Right, because I think the ultimate human desire is for connection. And mm -hmm. that's what it's doing. And so like you look at our culture now and there's so much divisiveness and so on. And I don't think that's unrelated to the way in which we're supposed to present so 
cheer, so cheerfully and so successfully all the time, um, that means we're not really able to connect with each other. Right, right, because we're fronted <clears throat> and we're wearing that mask and yeah. we're trying to, you know, appear or present in a certain way to be approved of or to be received in a manner that, you know, we would desire. And that ultimately just alienates us from one another. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. I tend and to I, look at these things, and I've said this many times before, like as somebody who's been sober for a long time, like through the lens of recovery. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more that I was reading your book, the more I couldn't help but think about how this operates in the 12 step context, because you, you're part of this community that has a, a you know, kind of a, a shared narrative about the pain that they've endured and the mm -hmm. struggles that they've, you know, sort of overcome to be in this place. Uh, but then, you know, somebody has the courage to get up in front of a group of people and share their pain and their grief and their sorrow, but do it with a level of levity and also a level of, of, of specificity. And I found the more specific it is, the more universal it is. Like when somebody, I may not, relate to the facts of that person's experience, but I can relate to the emotional experience that they've had. And, and you can't help but feel incredibly bonded to this person and to, and to the group through the courage and the pain and the grief and the levity that makes it all this, you know, soupy mess of <laughs> emotions mm -hmm. that, that just make you feel more human. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, as you were, describing that what came into my mind is Darwin actually because mm -hmm. um, Darwin was actually he was a really kind of gentle and melancholic type of person like he, so he's known for survival of the fittest but he was actually this guy who like he couldn't stand the sight of blood his, his father wanted him to be a doctor and he took one look at like what surgery looked like and you know fled to the the jungles of the Galapagos to look at beetles. And, um, and he noticed from very early on, I mean, he, he was very aware of how cruel and violent animals and humans could be with each other. But he also noticed at the same time that there's this impulse that mammals and humans have that when they see another being in distress, that they feel the distress themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it just gets mirrored and, and it's, it's happening at a really like quick and pre-conscious level. Um, and he thought that that was the strongest impulse of all in humans. So people talk about how he's known for survival of the fittest, but he could, you could equally talk about survival of the kindest. And, um, and now we're seeing the fruits of that like 150 years later in the research, like there's a guy named Dacher Keltner at, at Berkeley who does all this amazing research. And he's found, for example, that um, we all have a vagus nerve, which is the most important, biggest bundle of nerves in our bodies, mm -hmm. regulates breathing and digestion. And your vagus nerve um, becomes activated when you see, like when you were in your, your AA group and, and seeing somebody talk about their troubles, if you felt that sense of like your heart opening up or you know your your throat closing or whatever it is that's partly your vagus nerve is mm. is becoming activated almost against your will you know it just happens and yeah and and so to cut that off from each other you know the ability to relate to each other right. that way is cutting off one of our most basic ways of bonding right so there's there is this implicit like evolutionary advantage Right to indulging in 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 this kind of emotional landscape. Yeah, and I wouldn't call. I mean, even the word indulging, like I, or I wouldn't think of it as allowing. Or like maybe. allowing, yeah, yeah, allowing. yeah, to allowing exactly. I mean, it actually comes from our need as mammals to be able to take care of our young. You know, like you have to take care of a baby who's mm -hmm. crying, and that's how they let you know that they need something. Um, because we're primed to be able to do that that kind of radiates outward to our ability to react to each other right. in general in that right. way. And we don't always get it right, but that is one deep aspect yeah. of being human. And the neurochemistry tracks to the vagus nerve. Yeah, exactly. Which, which makes me think this is like deeply primal, it's, dating all the way back. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And the vagus nerve is like one of the most ancient parts of the human mm -hmm. body. Right. So it's, it's really 
fascinating. Yeah, this idea of 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 bittersweetness. Um, I think most people think of it as an experience, but you talk about it as like a state of being. So distinguish those two things and how you arrived at that point of view. Yeah. So I mean. It is an experience in the sense of, you know, like the moment where you're walking your child down the aisle or something. That is a quintessential bittersweet experience. But there's also a view of the world and a way of being in the world that's quite bittersweet. Um, you could call it melancholic, except that word in our culture is sort associated with clinical depression. Yeah. And, and that's not really what it means, or, or it's not the way I'm using it. Um, so the bittersweet state of being is much more about like this sense of it, it it's a sense of that awareness of joy and sorrow and of fragility um aristotle 2000 years ago asked the question of like he asked this question of what why is it that so many of our great poets philosophers and politicians all have a melancholic temperament like, what, what is that so it's something about being attuned to the gap between the world as it is and the world as we would wish it to be. Mm, mm. You know, there's like, it's like the, the emotional DNA of humans is like, we come into this world with a sense that there is a more perfect and beautiful world that's out there somewhere to which we belong, but we somehow find ourselves here instead. Right. And so it's not, it's, it's this, the yearning and the long, the longing, like the idea that things could be better. It's not a despairing per se, but it's a, it's a sense that like we're in a certain place, it could be better. And, and the melancholic impulse is built out of like how to get from one to the other. Yeah. And it, it's like, it's the heart of our creative impulse. You know, it's like a feeling of like, how do you get closer to that perfect and beautiful world? for which you mm -hmm. are yearning, you know? So that the word longing, like it literally means to grow longer and to reach for. So there is a sense in which we're all reaching to get to this other place. Yeah. And that's what, that's what propels us forward. And like, historically, we've always known this. It's really only recently that we've forgotten it. So like with the Odyssey, Homer, um, that, that whole adventure, it starts with Homer who's, on a beach weeping for his homeland because he's so he's so homesick. And because he's so homesick, he goes out into the water and has this adventure. Um, it's the same thing with all our religions, you know, like we're longing for the Garden of Eden, we're longing for Mecca, we're longing for Zion. And and all the religions that like the teaching is that it's through the longing that you get closer to the divine itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's an incredibly generative state. Right. And it's also tempor it's about temporality as well, right? This idea of fragility and nothing lasts forever and mm -hmm. we're only here for a short period of time. And that ticking clock, you know, kind of a la memento mori yeah, um, yeah. is is sort of a driver behind this state as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I actually tried practicing memento mori um, uh -huh. while I was writing the book. So like memento mori, it, it basically means remembering death, you know, mm -hmm. like, as a way of like understanding how precious life is. And that idea comes to us from many different traditions. Um, so I tried it and I actually found it to be so incredibly helpful. Um, and the, the place I really noticed it is like, my kids at the time were pretty little and we had this bedtime ritual that we were doing and, and it was an amazing time of day. And it was like reliably the time that they would open up about whatever was on their minds. And it was just great. Um, and I also was bringing my cell phone into the room while I did that, you know, while we would do bedtime, I would say to myself, you know, like they may not be here tomorrow. You may not be here tomorrow. <laughs> you have no idea. Mm -hmm. And just that, a thought would completely extinguish any desire I had to look at the cell phone. It was like, it was gone. And mm -hmm. I, I stopped bringing it into the room completely. Um, and it didn't feel, it didn't feel sad. It didn't feel depressing. It was just a reminder. Right. That for me, you know, connects to gratitude. Like mm -hmm. if I can be present, that's, that's the, that's what I'm trying to cultivate. It's not necessarily a bitter sweetness other than like, oh my goodness, if this is the last time that I'm able to do this, 
there's a there's a dusting of sadness on that, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, it's complicated. It's complicated. Like having to tease all this stuff out. No wonder it took you so long to write this book, <laughs> you know? Just trying to wrap my head around like what it is and what it isn't, how you cultivate it, you know, how to, how to you know, channel it appropriately. Um, well, do you know the feeling I'm talking about when you listen? I don't know what kind of music you love. I mean, we all like many different kinds. I mean, kinds, I love but, Leonard Cohen and uh-huh. I know he's your spirit animal. So, <laughs> he's you know, my spirit animal, ahead. it's true. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just like, yeah, I started out with that question of why sad music, like what's so great about it? And it, that seemed like a kind of narrow question. I didn't mm-hmm. really realize it was going to become a whole book. Um, it was more that that was a gateway question into this whole, into this whole state. Right, but if you look at the the musicians, the great poets, the writers, all of the you know painters, the ones that seem to resonate the most are the ones who are have the facility to uh, the capacity to kind of take these seemingly conflicting emotional states or the polarities of them mm-hmm. and weave them in some way that makes sense to us as humans, but perhaps transcends our ability to like articulate. And I think when you see it, it's sort of like, when you hear it, you know it, when you see it, you know it. Yes. You're not sure why, like, why is it that the, the minor key or these certain songs and the way that they're constructed um, cultivate that in ourselves? I don't know if there's neurochemistry on that or any science on that, but it really is like, I know what that is. I don't know why I know what that is. It makes me feel this certain way that is, you know, perhaps, you know, seemingly off my optimal state. And yet there's a comfort, like you talk about rainy days and things like that, like you kind of want to languish in it. Yeah, there's a comfort and there's a, there's a transcendence in it. Mm -hmm. With Leonard Cohen, the very first artistic act that he took was when he was nine years old and his father died. And, um, and he, he took one of his father's bow ties and he wrote a poem and he buried the bow tie and the poem in the garden, in the backyard garden of their family house. And that was his first artistic act. And it was like, he was kind of repeating that act again and again throughout his career. There's a kind of like taking something painful and then turning it into something else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like the real, in terms of how to live, that's the real insight that this whole, that this tradition gives us because it's kind of saying to us, these moments are going to come, these pains are going to come, and you have two choices of what to do with them. You know, you can suppress it in some way, and inevitably you're going to take it out on yourself in the form of depression or addiction or whatever it is, or you're going to take it out on someone else, mm-hmm. abuse, passive aggression. Um, or you can take those pains and sit with them somehow, and then make meaning out of them and transform them. And that's something that we do so naturally, you know, like, like after 9-11, you suddenly see all these people signing up to be firefighters, you know, like the, the spike of applications, mm-hmm. it goes way up. Um, after the pandemic, lots of medical school and nursing school applications. So people are like running, you, you, you think they might be running Towards away from the thing those things. that is creating the pain. Exactly, exactly. But it's a way of, of, of making sense out of it and of making meaning of it and turning it into something better. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of our fundamental impulses yeah, when we're said, at our best. Right, like take your pain and 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 transmute it, turn it into a creative offering. Yeah, yeah. And, that's an and, I, and I use the, the word creative, the I, I mean, in a very, yeah. uh, in a very broad mean, way. I don't mean paint to painting. <laughs> and spend seven years writing a book. It can be <laughs> anything, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's that's really powerful and I've thought, you know, I've like that made me reflect on my own life and realize that without being consciously aware of it, like I've done that. So there is something instinctual in us that's drawn to that practice. And um before when when you were still like before you were in recovery, do you think you were taking the other path or like Oh, I mean, before I, when I was indulging in my addiction, no, mm-hmm. I was running away from everything and mm-hmm. repressing all of those challenging emotions and medicating myself mm-hmm. essentially mm-hmm. because those emotions were too painful or I wasn't mature enough to really, you know, excavate them. And I was, you know, at the behest of a, of a powerful substance yeah, you know, yeah, that hijacked yeah. me. So, right. um, and I think most recovering addicts 
you know, we'll be able to relate to that. And I think there's something interesting about the recovery community and what you kind of learn is that there's there's something aspirational there, even in the attic. Like they're they're looking for a higher experience of self and consciousness, and they're mm-hmm. doing it in a very self-destructive and unhealthy way. But at the very core of it is like there there should be something better, or I'm in pain and I'm reaching for something else. Yeah, you know, and and then when you get sober and you can continue to reach in a healthier direction people in recovery, like I know so many people who are just, they're just amazing human beings because they've learned to take that pain and turn it into some form of creative offering um, that is healing for not only themselves, but for a lot of other people. Prophets Walk Among Us. As a writer and podcaster for nearly 10 years, I've become more convinced than ever that our world is populated by scores of beautiful and brilliant people who have amazing stories to share. Those that we don't know who can teach us something new and leave us all the better for the experience of their sharing. And so I've dedicated my career to tracking down the most compelling prophets on the planet, going deep with each of them on my podcast, to elucidate the best of what they have to offer and to sharing the insights gleaned for the benefit of all. But the podcast is not the only medium by which to share their stories, which is why I'm proud to announce the release of my new book, Voicing Change, Volume Two. More than mere words on paper, Voicing Change is a physical manifestation of the magic, inspiration, and timeless wisdom that transpires each week on the Ritual Podcast. The first edition of Voicing Change was a beautifully rendered book worthy of display on any coffee table. And volume two follows in that tradition by showcasing even more of my favorite conversations in an elegant publication replete with interview excerpts, essays, and stunning photography, making for an exquisite companion to the first volume or a satisfying standalone work. Picking up this book allows you to revisit the wisdom of your favorite everyday prophets and physically interact with the life-changing ideas contained within. Voicing Change Volume 2, available now while supplies last for a limited time. Order your copy today only at richroll.com. I wrote most of Quiet in this cafe called Doma in Greenwich Village. Mm-hmm which no longer exists, tragically, because it was, it was my place. Um, It was such a great place. (laughs) It was like, it it just had this amazing creative energy and people would come from all over and, and, uh, and work on their stuff there and get to know each other. Um, And every, I I don't know if it was Tuesday nights or Thursday nights or whatever, but one or two nights a week, it would happen that this group of people would come in And I always noticed them because they always had like this special light about them. There was a kind of charisma in them. Um, And then I found out that they were all coming from an AA meeting. They were going for their coffee after the meeting. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. they would have been meeting like right down the street. Uh Um, There was something about this group that you could feel their reaching, you know, for Mm -hmm. transcendence or reaching for the more perfect and beautiful world you could just feel it in their very being. And I think they were probably at a moment in their lives where they were making the transition from doing that in an unhealthy way to doing it in a meaning making way. Right. Yeah. And I, one of the, one of the more powerful aspects of that is like making peace with that pain and, and kind of transcending the shame that's associated with that. And when you can kind of own it because you've unpacked it and looked at it and shared it and worked through it, um, that becomes a really powerful tool for continual growth, but mm-hmm. it requires like taking the blinders off and, and dealing with it. And really the subtext of bittersweet is, is for all of us to do that and appreciate you know, all the colors of life and to really challenge ourselves to embrace these difficult emotions rather than run away from them. And the larger, you know, the larger question that I'd, I'd love to hear from you on is like, how did we get to a culture that so forcibly, you, you know, pushes us in the direction of, of you know, repressing so much. Mm-hmm. I mean, 
start with the Calvinists and like walk us through like yeah. how we got to here and how we can kind of grow and mature as a society to have a healthier relationship with the nuance and complexity of the human psyche. Yeah, okay. Well, um, I'll start with like a glimpse of where we are right now and then I'm gonna go mm-hmm. back in time. So where we are right now, our problem is that we look at ourselves and each other in terms of are we winners or are we losers? You know, it's like this great binary and it's a kind of harsh binary. And, you know, the, the word loser literally has gone up astronomically mm-hmm. in usage over the past decades. But going back in time, so we started out as um, with Calvinism as the dominant religion. And Calvinism, the idea was that everybody was bound for either heaven or hell. And you really had no choice of which direction you were going in. But what you could do was kind of demonstrate to yourself and others that you were heaven bound. And the way that you demonstrated that was by being a really hard worker. So everything was about right. you know labor and hard work. Um, but then like, in the 19th century, that started to transform as we became more of a business culture. It became more about like how success, not so much how hard a worker are you, but how successful are you at business or how much do you fail in business? Mm -hmm. And then the question starts getting asked, well, when you succeed or fail, what is the reason? And with these echoes of Calvinism, um, and Barbara Ehrenreich talks about this in, in her book really brilliantly, Um, with these echoes of Calvinism, we answer the question by saying, you succeeded or failed because of something inside you. You know, it's like you're heaven bound, you're hell bound. You're either a born success or a born failure. And the more you start looking at things that way and really believing that, the more you need to develop the emotional affect, you know, the emotional self-presentation of somebody who's a success. Mm. So you don't want to talk about anything that suggests an acquaintance with longing or loss or fragility or memento mori, like any Mm -hmm. of it. You're not going to talk about anything like that. You're going to be presenting in a really cheerful way. And over the course of the 19th century, that became really explicit so that people stopped wanting even to talk about bad weather. Like that was seen as not cool, not appropriate to notice that there were clouds in the sky, literally. Um, and that that's kind of increased over time. So then you get to the, the Great Depression in 1929, and you have all these people who are losing all their money because of external forces, and some of them are committing suicide, and they're described as losers um, in the journalism. They're described right. as losers. And that's the heritage that we're still living with now. Um, there's, I think, a deep fear that people have of being a loser, Mm -hmm. you know, and a deep need to be a winner instead of like, (laughs) instead of seeing the actual truth of the situation is, which is that in all lives, there are successes and failures and wins and losses. And that's just how it is. Right. It's so interesting that it emanated out of this heaven, hell binary. Yeah. Um, Winners, losers, heaven, hell, rich, poor, these binaries that put us in buckets and allow us to judge each other. Yeah, and to judge ourselves, to judge ourselves. More more detrimentally, right? Yeah, I mean, the fear, when when people start feeling like they're getting closer to the loser side of that divide, Mm -hmm. I I think the the fear and the shame in that is overwhelming. But has that not even expanded? Because now, as we have moved even more towards this um, self-help obsessed culture. It's a, it's a happy, sad thing or a, you know, depressed, happy thing. And we're afraid of people who are demonstrating challenging emotions and we're sort of repelled by them. Like we move Mm -hmm. away from the person who's grieving or the person who is depressed because we don't have a comfort level or a vocabulary for how to communicate with them. And there's this sense that it's, contagious, right? Like you can't be associated with that. That's gotta go over there. And even our relationship with death to bring memento mori up, like it's in a hidden corner and we don't talk about it and we pretend it's not gonna happen to us. And um, we've sort of stripped it from our, our kind of daily experience of life, despite its inevitability. And there is something pathological about that. Oh yeah. And we, uh, 
you know, we allow people to grieve for a certain amount of time, but then after that, there's Get something. Over it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like really socially unacceptable. And that's because it's making me uncomfortable that you're still grieving. Like, I don't really want to be around that. You know, I think it's that, and I also think there's something. There's a way in which we judge it. You know, it's there's something distasteful about it. There's um, it's, there, it's it, weakness. I mean, yeah, like think of the admiration that we have mm. for people who, you know, they're like moving forward in a healthy, supposedly healthy way. Like even in the the most recent version of the DSM manual for um, in psychology, they've now limited the amount of time for grieving. I'm forgetting now the exact amount, but it's like a very short amount of time. And then mm. after that, you're considered to have a diagnosis if you're right. still in a state of grief for a, for a loved one. Right. That's so weird. Yeah. And like in Bittersweet, I tell the story of do you know Susan David? I do. Who I love. Yeah. Yeah. So she's a dear friend of mine. She's a great psychologist. Mm -hmm. And her work came out of her experience um, when she was 14 and she lost her father to cancer. Okay. And Susan is a really cheerful person by temperament. That's mm -hmm. like who she is. Um, so because of that, she felt all this cultural pressure. And because she's so cheerful, she put on a big show. For the whole year after her father died, she like went to school, acted as if nothing was wrong. Everyone would say, are you okay? She was like, sure, I'm fine. Um, but in the meantime, she's off in the bathroom vomiting up her lunch every day. So that's how it was coming mm -hmm. out for her. And she would have kept going on that way until in her English class, she had a teacher who had also lost a parent at a young age. And the teacher hands out blank notebooks to the class and says... And, and she looks Susan straight in the eyes. And she says, I want you to write down what you're truly feeling. And no one else is going to read it except me. And I'm hardly going to comment at all. But just write the truth. Write the truth of your experiences. And Susan said that moment for her, it was like a revolution in a notebook. Because it was like the only time she had been invited to actually tell mm -hmm. the truth. Um, and that was her healing. Mm -hmm. And like, that's what, that's what we don't do. Right. And that's what leads to this whole life of exploring emotional resilience and how to develop it, right? And yes. certainly by repressing or running away from these difficult experiences and emotions is to undercut our ability to develop that level of resilience to weather the difficult times that we all inevitably face. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that the more... I mean, th there's really interesting data on it, you know, that the more we have a sense of the fragility of existence, the more of a sense of gratitude we have, um, the less angry we feel, uh, the more we invest in meaningful relationships. Right. So it's uh, What yeah. I was fascinated by <clears throat> in the book was you dipping your toe <clears throat> into the, uh, sorry, I've got a frog in my throat, <clears throat> into the uh, life extension world. Yeah. Like the, you know, yeah. the sort of, uh, um, we're going to live forever crowd. Yeah. And I know some of those people and I'm familiar with that kind of uh, scene. So walk me through that because there is some, there's so many profound philosophical questions that come up. So and many. Psychological profiles that you could render about the people who are obsessed with this mm -hmm. that I think are not getting an appropriate amount of attention or discussion. Yeah, I agree with you. And in fact, when I went to one of these conferences, I was just assuming that there was going to be all kinds of philosophical discussion right. about whether this was a good idea or not, or like what the, no, what the downsides totally were. No, it's totally Pollyanna on that. Oh my God, yeah. no, no, no. It's much, yeah, I mean, it's much more like, thank goodness everybody here is beyond all those questions. We mm. don't have to talk about that. We know it's a good <laughs> idea. That's really the vibe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I had um, I've had a couple people on the podcast who are from that world, and and I can't help but think like philosophically, like what is your relationship to life if you could live for three hundred years? Like, how does that change the choices that you make, the risks that you're willing to incur, <clears throat> and you know the kind of relationships that you're going to have with people? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that doesn't really seem to be uh, of interest. To the well, people that are. I mean, they talk about it, but they talk about it in a way that resolves it very neatly. Like they talk about terror management theory, which is basically, um, okay, that's the idea that, 
that when we <clears throat> are, there are all these studies that show that when we're reminded of our mortality, that in the immediate aftermath of being reminded of it, we become much more like focused in our, on our in-groups and hostile to out-groups. Mm. So there's like studies where they'll remind people of their mortality and then ask them how much hot sauce they want to put on the food that they're going to give to people in the opposing political party. And people will put on too much hot sauce because um, they, they get into this sort of anti-out-group mode. Right. So, okay. So the, they take that and they say, well... This means that when we solve the problem of mortality, we're also going to be solving all our other problems of conflict and war and everything else. Because it's like, if we could solve this, we'll solve everything else. And that's where I feel like, I, I met, there's ways in which I'm actually really sympathetic to the Life Extension Project, but I do feel like it's kind of missing the larger point that our problems are not only about the fact of mortality. Mm -hmm. you know, the problems are much <clears throat> deeper mm -hmm. than that. You know, they have to do with with just all the longings of existence that right. would be here whether or not we lived forever. Depending upon, yeah, like they're still they're still there. We're not going to sidestep that. And I think, right. of course, there's something aspirational about tackling this problem, mm -hmm. and it's fascinating to learn about it. And there have been these amazing breakthroughs in science, etc. Um, but I can't help but think whether or not it's being driven by a, just a deep-seated fear of death that's so desperate that we must solve this problem because I don't want to have to face that myself. Well, I think they would actually, in some ways, agree with that. I mean, part of the reason that I went to, um, that I went to, to see them and to study them is because I, I was interested just in this culture that we live in, you know, that wants everything mm -hmm. to be like, winning in sunshine all the time. And I thought this would be a really interesting example of that. But what I actually found is all the scientists would get up on stage and present their thing. They would begin their scientific presentation, usually by telling a really heartrending story of a person that they had lost in their lives, you know, and of how harrowing and how terrible the bereavement had been. Mm -hmm. And And so they were like quite explicitly saying, they were like, this is so terrible. You know, we, we just, as a society, should not be tolerating this, this deep pain. We should be doing something about it. So there was a way in which I was like really moved because I felt like they, they were doing their own version of taking a pain and trying to transform it into something else. And their, their something else is immortality itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and what they would say, I think to your point is, well, the the idea that we have that there's a way in which death or mortality gives us meaning to life, that that's like a nice story that we tell ourselves because we have no choice. But if we really did have a choice, then we might not be telling that story anymore. Right, right, right. Um, and I'm not so sure about that. Time will but, tell. But it's funny that you say 300 years because I feel like you know, 300 years, that kind of sounds sort of plausible to me. Because if you think about it, we used to only, we, have, we would have life expectancies right. of 35 or 40. You know, now it's 70 or 80 or whatever it is. And we're totally comfortable with having doubled it. Mm -hmm. So but that's different from the achieving <clears throat> life, expect, what is it called? Life expectancy velocity or escape velocity. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. What is that? Longevity philosophy? Longev yeah, Some, yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. Where yeah. just basically every year you live like the science is extends the ability to extend the life right right proportionately more or whatever so that by by definition that means you could potentially live forever right yeah. theoretically <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah we'll see i don't know um but on that subject that's not a distant cousin from this idea of of transcendence and so i'm interested in in how this dovetails into a discussion around um spirituality and religion, these traditions of religion uh, that relate to to bittersweetness, that kind of you know percolate across all these different variations of of of, <clears throat> of practice, mm -hmm. I guess, because um, that's super interesting, right? There is something elegiac about all of this. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I had no idea when I started off in this path that I was going to end up writing and thinking so much about religion. Um, 
But I started realizing this whole subject is like intricately bound up with that because almost every religion that I see, like the, especially the mystical sides of, of our religions, they're all talking about this state of longing that all beings have for you know, union with the divine, essentially. Um, and, and the idea that the state of longing is actually healthy in that way. You know, like Rumi, the, the 12th mm-hmm. century Sufi poet, you know, he, he says, be thirsty. You know, and that the, 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 the longing you express, well, he has this one poem where he's talking about, um, about a man who's praying to God, to, uh, to Allah, and he doesn't get an answer back. And so he becomes kind of bitter and disappointed um, and he stops praying. And then, um, and then he falls into a sleep and he's not sleeping well. And Khidr, who's the guide of souls, comes along to him and says, why did you stop praying? And the man says, because I never got an answer. And, and, and the guide of souls says to him, the longing that you express, that is the return message. And the right. grief that you cry out from is exactly what draws you towards union. And so this is the message that we get again and again mm-hmm. from these traditions. Mm-hmm. Like the grief is what draws you towards the ultimate love that you seek. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the yearning, it's it's like an it's almost like a a, a spiritual ouroboros though because these things are 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 a circle they're a cycle right like the yearning the the answer that you seek is in the yearning itself yeah right yeah yeah it's really beautiful yeah and I, and I don't think well I don't know I mean maybe someone does I wouldn't know but I I don't know that we ever like actually get there on this earth but there's something about the act of the striving of drawing closer that. Yeah is intensely satisfying. Yeah. And how did that exploration land for you as somebody who who kind of identifies as agnostic, but you had this grandfather who was this beautiful rabbi. Yeah. Um, Where did this lead you? Well, it was really interesting for me because I grew, yeah, my grandfather was an Orthodox rabbi and like, I really adored him. Everybody did. And he he was like such a huge figure in my life. Um, And at the same time, I've always been deeply agnostic um, and didn't really honestly think that much about religion once mm-hmm. I became an adult. You know, I was kind of dismissive of it, if anything. Um, but I don't know. I started to realize that the the thing that I feel when I listen to sad music and what someone else might feel, and I do to some extent when I'm in nature or something like that, the way I see it is that they're all manifestations of the same experience. And for some people, they have that experience through the language of the divine and religion. And for others, they have it through music or art or sports or whatever it is, mm-hmm. but we're all kind of reaching for that same state. Um, and in fact, there's this Hasidic parable that I came across that talks about, <laughs> that there's a rabbi and he has a man in his congregation who he notices is paying no attention at all. Um, and isn't really buying what the rabbi is saying. And then the rabbi hums for the man a, a yearning melody, a bittersweet melody. And the man listens and he says, now I understand what you've been trying to tell me all this time because I'm feeling this intense longing to be united with God. Right. And I, I read that and I was like, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm that old man. Yeah. That's you, that's you. That you know. That's Leonard Cohen for you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And what is it about that minor key, or that musical sensibility that elevates the soul, and can't help but leave you wondering whether there is something more beyond the senses? Yeah, I think it's because it's touching that that sense that we all have of there being some other place that we're reaching for. Mm -hmm. You know, you see it in like the Wizard of Oz, right? It's like Dorothy's longing for somewhere over the rainbow. Um, You look at all our children's stories. There's always the protagonist who enters the scene, you know, at the moment they become an orphan. That's when the whole adventure begins. Like the moment they're thrust into the state of primal longing. Um, so, So I think that's just tapping into a DNA that we all share. Although it manifests differently right. for each as, of us, as you know, there's a there's this idea that you know this shared proclivity towards 
their sweetness allows us to understand that we are one super organism, mm -hmm. but perhaps it it extends beyond the vagus nerve, right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> right, and right. And you who like, you're exploring Judaism and Sufism and these various religions and, and mystical traditions. And there are similarities that they're, they're very different in many ways, but there are these similarities that unite them. And from that, you know, can one extrapolate you know, something, some truth about the beyond or our relationship with something more ethereal and non-material. Yeah, and I, it's not like I, I don't know that exploring all this gives, you know, definitive answers to any of these lifelong questions, but for me, it gave, um, it offers a kind of roadmap of how to live, you know, because what it does is it makes you notice how incredibly miraculous everything around us actually is, you know, how sacred mm -hmm. it really is. Whether you're an atheist or believer, I'm just using those words, like the, the wonder of it all. Um, and you get into, you, you can enter into a relationship with that kind of wonder. Yeah. That really, it's, it's a complete enhancement, a really transformation of what yeah. life is like. It's a better way to live. It's a much better way you know? to live. And it can be, the good news live. is you can cultivate it in whatever tradition suits you. Absolutely, absolutely. There are so many paths towards that. Yeah, and we actually found, you know, in that bittersweet quiz that we did that people who score high in bittersweetness also score high in um, states of awe and wonder mm -hmm. and spirituality, which- That's not, It's not surprising, It's course. not surprising. Yeah. Right. So what think, is the relationship between bittersweetness and awe and wonder? They're like two sides of a, a similar coin. Are they not? Yeah, they are because um, they basically, they're both born of um, a, a, a receptivity and a noticing of everything that is. So you're not only mm -hmm. noticing one side of what is, you know, you're like, looking for the truth of everything. Mm -hmm. And that's what gets you into that state. Yeah, I think when I think of awe and wonder, I think of being present. Like if you're, you, if you're present enough and you just see the leaf on the tree, you know, that could inspire awe and wonder, but it mm -hmm. requires like a level of attention that, that, that kind of eludes, you know, the way that we live our lives, right? Like you have to really, really be practiced in that or habitual in it. There's another, parable that I came across that I found incredibly useful as a way to live. Um, and this one also came from the Kabbalah. And it's the idea that all of creation was originally this intact divine vessel. It was all intact. And then it broke, the, the, the vessel broke. And the world that we're living in now is the world after the breakage. And yet the shards of this vessel are scattered everywhere around us. And so what we can do, we're, we're still living in the broken world, but we're living in a world where you can bend down and pick up these shards of light. Mm. And I love this as a way to live because it's like a way of making sense of the tragedies that are still and always part of this world, but yet being able to turn in the direction of joy and beauty because mm -hmm. you're not denying the tragedies. You're not believing that there, a utopia is gonna come but you're still able to bend down and pick up the mm -hmm. shards of light that you personally notice. And we're mm -hmm. all gonna notice different ones, mm -hmm. um, but they're yours for the taking, yours yeah. to, be, to pick up. Yeah, I, I, that's I find really that very beautiful. Helpful. There's a, but there's also packed into that a little bit of a lament of what once was or could have been had it not shattered. That's true. Right? But I don't know, I, I don't know a way to live without yeah. that lament when you look at the tragedies in the world, like you have to make space sure. for the lament also. Sure. Otherwise you're just living with blinders, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, is this attunement to bittersweetness trainable? Like you can take the bittersweet test and see where you score on it. And certain people are obviously more attuned or receptive to this than others. But to the extent that appreciating bittersweetness or cultivating it or or kind of synthesizing all the different colors of your experience into some kind of creative offering and making sense of it for yourself seems to be something that anybody can do. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, even if they score lower on that on that test, they could increase their score and and perhaps like, um, you know, elevate the rit- richness of their life experience in in so doing. Yeah. So there are going to be some people who are born into the world with that high sensitivity trait, and they're probably going to tend in this bittersweet direction mm-hmm. from the beginning. Then there's going to be a lot of people who, just by virtue of life experience, come to more of a bittersweet awareness over time. Right. You know, once, once they things happen in their life, things happen, jar them out of their lack of empathy or <laughs> whatever it is. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and for people who aren't there yet but would want to be, I, I think it's just a matter of turning your awareness in your direction. I, I'm sorry, turning your awareness in certain directions. Mm-hmm. Um, that's scary though. Well, it's scary if you think that by doing that, you'll never come out again. And, mm-hmm. and that's what I hear from a lot of people. They're like, you know, I'm afraid if I go there, I won't be able to come out. Mm-hmm. And and yet there's no reason that that should be so because these two states are always paired, right? Mm-hmm. It's joy and sorrow. So there's no reason you have to stay in one state. It's yeah. more just a, a sense of being able to tell the truth about everything that's happening or yeah. everything you observe. Yeah. The fear but why do you think it's scary? Um, I mean, I just think you're asking people to confront painful past emotions or to look objectively at stuff that they've kind of worked hard to build walls around, right? So that prospect of deconstructing those walls and really grappling with some past trauma or some something that occurred or whatever that you've kind of really tried hard to like, <laughs> move away from mm-hmm. requires a, a, a certain level of, of courage. And I think it is frightening for a lot of people. Like I know a lot of people who have built walls around certain, you know, certain pains in their life. And by dint of that are able to kind of safely navigate through their life, but they wanna stay in that lane. Mm-hmm. And if you say, listen, mm-hmm. you're missing a huge growth opportunity or a certain level of, of enriching life experience by ignoring that, you should look at it. And if you work through it, like your life is gonna open up in ways you can't possibly imagine. Intellectually, they may understand that. And I can kind of see that arc awaiting that person. But for a lot of people, it's like, that's fine. I hear you, but I'm not gonna do that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you've had that. I mean, your story about your mom in on a certain level, like illustrates this for me. Like I, I what I read in that was, you know, a certain um, uh, kind of affect in your mother. Like she had, she had her own, you know, painful experiences growing up, and that very much informed how she interrelated with you at times in very unhealthy ways. But could you have been able to get your mother to kind of confront her past traumas so that you could have had a healthier relationship with her? That that seems like a very steep mountain to climb. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think people are at different points along where they are in their lives. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you're not ready at a certain moment and you are 10 years later. Um, and I, I guess another thing yeah, but sorry, just to go back, that's an interesting question with my mom because I've often thought, you know, would there have been a way to have her be open to that if mm-hmm. I had thought about how to get there to do that? And right. Yeah, I don't I mean, think I ever did. I mean, explain a little bit, like tell a little bit of that story. The story, yeah. So, um, so I had a really... Um, intensely close relationship with my mother growing up. It was a kind of Garden of Eden type of childhood. Um, she was incredibly loving, devoted, warm, you know, amazing company. We really loved each other's company. Um, yeah, it was really quite wondrous. Um, but but my mother had past traumas of her own. Mm-hmm. And this made it so that when I became an adolescent, she had a really terrible time, especially because I was the youngest child. She had a really terrible time um, with my growing up and becoming independent and having different ideas and different life experiences. And and her reaction to that was incredibly (laughs) difficult, to say the least. Um, And and I had a lot of trouble with it too. Like I, I, I felt like I'd I didn't use these words in, in those days, but it was a kind of like casting out of the Garden of Eden. Mm-hmm. Like suddenly the mother that I had known all my life 
had transformed into a hostile person um, who, where there was kind of a choice. I, I could either still be with her and still be a child and be loved, or I could grow up mm -hmm. and develop and be myself and be cast out. Right. And, and I don't think I ever really questioned the choice. So I went and moved in a separate direction. Um, but the casting out part was like incredibly, incredibly painful. And, um, and my way of dealing with it, because I'm a writer and I'd loved writing since I was four years old, I wrote everything down into these diaries that I kept and went off to college. And at the end of freshman year, for some reason, I had to stay on campus for a few extra days and my parents came to take my stuff home. And just as they were getting ready to leave and they're like leaving with all my suitcases, I take my diaries and I hand them to my mother. Um, and I thought at the time, like I truly, on a conscious level, I thought I was just giving them to her for safekeeping. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't have a place to store them at school. Um, and I never thought that she would read them on a conscious level, but of course she did. And whatever I had written there, and I say whatever, cause I've never read them again since, but whatever I had written there, you know, kind of like put the final nail in the coffin of our relationship. Mm -hmm. And so we, we still, for the decades after, we were still, you know, seeing each other at holidays and right. doing all the regular family stuff, but the relationship really was never the same yeah. again. And it was like, it was a loss for me that I couldn't, for years, I couldn't even talk about my mother without crying. I couldn't mention her name. Yeah. Um, but I will say there's been this amazing rapprochement. Uh, now my mother has Alzheimer's and she still, she, she only has a few conversational lanes that she can travel, but when she's on those lanes, she still feels like herself. And she has completely forgotten all the difficult years we, we had. Mm. She's forgotten them. And so all this time through my adulthood, I had always been asking myself, you know, that childhood that you remember as being so wonderful, like maybe it wasn't really true. You know, maybe that was just like a child's misperception. But now the mother of that childhood has come back. Like, I, and I realize, like we still, we still are that way. You know, the, yeah. the, the relationship we have now is the same relationship we had when I was a kid. Right. Um, so that's been, that's been a kind of amazing it's Such an interesting return. story. And there, it, it's certainly, there's bittersweetness in it, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah so yeah. much. Um, but the idea that you were faced with this choice of either reverting into a childlike state or just becoming the person that your mother actually wanted you to be, put mm -hmm. you in an impossible situation without her being consciously aware of the kind of psychic toll that that would place on you. And then the bittersweetness of never really fully reconciling that later, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I read it as somebody who, because of her past traumas and pain that she hadn't adequately worked through, there's this transference, like she wants you to be safe. She wants you to be upwardly mobile and all of these things. And she, she lovingly drives you um, on this kind of ambitious journey to achieving all these amazing things. But as you achieve them, of course, separation occurs. And that's a threat to this bond that she has that is so meaningful for her that is in part driven by the pain of her past, mm -hmm, right? That mm -hmm. creates this unhealthy soup where she's transferring so much of her identity onto you. And you're as a young person having to shoulder that burden. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's funny. I'm actually gonna um, amend something I said before because I think I said a minute ago that I had never really considered doing anything other than growing into a separate mm -hmm. person. But actually, I'm not sure that's quite right because I do remember many times saying to myself, you know, like I loved her so much. All I wanted was for her to be happy. So I felt like, well, maybe I should do some of these things that she's asking, you know, mm -hmm. so that she can still be happy, um, which is a very difficult thing. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. But and did so, you have a sense of her self-awareness around any of this or just no? 
I don't think so. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I don't really know. Yeah. Um, I don't think there was so much of it. But what I will say happened, <clears throat> excuse me, over the years, and especially during the time I wrote this book, you know, as I told you, like, it used to be that I couldn't talk about her at all without crying. And I, I wrote her story. I wrote the story in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like really worried about what was going to happen when I would go out and do interviews about the book. I thought I, I won't be able to speak about this without breaking down. And, and, and despite everything I'm saying in the book about being comfortable with all our emotions, I didn't really want to do that. Right. So, um, yeah, so I didn't know what would happen. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but I, I, I remember talking to somebody about this dilemma and he said to me, you know, talk to me when you're done writing the book because you might actually resolve mm -hmm. some of these issues. And at the time he said that, I thought, oh my gosh, that's never going to happen. Um, but in fact, that's exactly what happened. There's just a sense of peace that, that I now have mm -hmm. um, with everything that happened. And I don't know, just so much love for her and understanding of it all and like wishing that it had been different. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, I don't know. It's just a complete reconciliation. Well, that's the that's the beauty and the gift of reckoning with your bittersweetness, right? Yeah, like yeah. you can have some kinship with Leonard Cohen, who I'm sure similarly was having you know uh, conflicting emotions and was in some sort of pain, and he was trying to work through it. So what does he do? He writes a song about it, right? You write a book about it, and in the process of writing this book, you find a way to heal and make peace with yourself and your loved ones and come out the other side like a more complete human. And that goes to the very thesis of the book, which is channeling your pain and, and you know, turning it into a creative offering. So it's like a, it's a, it's like a, a you know, a meta example, like it's all very meta in that regard, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. Um, and, and I do wanna be careful to say like for anybody listening, Again, that we use that word creative in a really general way. So it's not like you have to go and write a right. book or mm -hmm. write a song or, you know, like be a Grammy award winner or something. It's not, it has nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. It's more just about going through a kind of transformation of like taking the pain and transforming it into yeah. something of meaning. Yeah. Well, just yeah. confronting it and walking, walking with it and finding a way to come to the other side through whatever, you know, modality suits you. Yeah, right. it's funny. I've been trying to write this story for so many years. Like I, I said this in the book, I first started writing about it when I was in college. And my creative writing teacher said, you're way too close to this story. You should like put it in a drawer and not take it out again mm -hmm. for 30 years. Um, so it's been a long time. Later. And now it's 30 years later. <laughs> you're too yeah. close to it. Yeah. But you're still so close to it, you know, but you were, you're, you're distant enough from it that you could write about it with, some level of objectivity, but the fact that it that it creates so much emotion in you, you know, it's still very present with you. Yeah, it's still very present, mm -hmm. but like with a lot less turmoil than mm -hmm. there used to be. Like I experience very little turmoil now talking about it because yeah. I, I really do feel such a sense of resolution between us and between like my relationship to my mother in my heart. Is right. very different yeah, 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 from what it had been. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Um, on this idea of 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 binaries, heaven, hell, um, rich, poor, and the like, there is this undercurrent in our society around around the pursuit of happiness. Right? It's in the it's in the Declaration of Independence, like yeah. the pursuit of happiness. And now we're in a happiness obsessed culture. Um, I think we're getting to a point where we're we're maturely grappling with what happiness means and trying to create a healthier relationship with how to build that into our lives. But in reading your book, um, I couldn't help but think, what would happen if that phrase in in the Declaration of Independence said something like, you know, may you may you uh, you know pursue longing or you know, <laughs> something like that. May you grapple <clears throat> with your own bittersweetness. Like if we had created a cultural priority around a more nuanced relationship with the conflicting emotions about what it means to be human, how would that percolate into our culture and change our relationship with the darker 
side of things that, you know, make the brighter things so much brighter? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I've thought about that with the Declaration of Independence because I actually, I mean, I enjoy being happy as much as the next person. Mm -hmm. So it's not, so I don't think happiness is the problem, but maybe it's just how we define happy. Maybe meaning would happiness have been Happiness at the cost of everything else. Yeah, and I, I think we end up interpreting happiness as a kind of like hedonic type of happiness as opposed to a happiness where you feel a, a deep sense of meaning uh -huh. in your life. Um, and I also think part of the problem is that we have such a separation of church and state, which is great in most ways, but it means that all these questions that religion naturally grapples with, like this existential longing that we all have, um, we tend to relegate that to what you experience, you know, at church on Sundays, mm -hmm. as opposed to just thinking of that as part of everyday life. Mm. Yeah, but as and, we become more uh, agnostic as a culture, are we not uh, adequately, you know, in 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 constructs where we are actively confronted with grappling with these philosophical questions and wait, say the question again. Is it meaning like you're saying that the purview of that kind of inquiry would be in the church or whatever spiritual tradition, but as we've become kind of more, we've become a culture that's that seems, at least from my perspective, like less uh, interested in those types of uh, you know outlets, mm -hmm. and so where does that leave us in terms of of you know how we're dealing with those bigger spiritual and philosophical questions? Yeah, that's the problem because we've always relegated it just yeah. to that. So it was already bad enough when when but it was relegated. Not going there anymore, but now we don't even go there. Right. So now it's kind of because, nowhere. You know, Dancing with the Stars is on, and <laughs> you know. yeah, exactly. So. I think we need to find ways of introducing this into part of everyday discourse. And you could see how much we long for it because, you know, you look at, to take my patron saint of Leonard Cohen, like there's a reason that his song Hallelujah was making people cry for years on end. You know, it, it's like the most covered song, I think, in history or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, people are relating to that. As soon as they hear it, they open up to it. So we need to be finding different ways of introducing this right. into everyday life. Um, and I think part of that would actually be just kind of proactively engaging with beauty more in everyday yeah. life, you know, like at work, at school, like actively encouraging people to bring in things that they find beautiful or meaningful and be sharing those. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to talk about bittersweetness so much. It's like through through engaging with beauty, all of that comes out. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about Jeff Buckley's rendition of Hallelujah? <laughs> Is that sacrilege? It's not sacrilege at all. <laughs> I, I like it. It's not one of my favorites, but yeah. I do really like it. I mean, um, but no, I'm all for he, covers. He, it's but okay. he, he captures the bittersweetness. He sure in does. His music beautifully. He really does. Yeah. I like the uh, Rufus Wainwright one. Mm, oh yes, very good. Yeah, That's right. I'd forgotten about that one. Um, I think a good story to tell would be the story of Beethoven that you share um, around that performance because that so kind of captures this idea of of you know channeling channeling that emotional experience into something shared. That, yeah, that 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 breeds that community piece, right? Yeah, so Beethoven, you know, one of his, maybe his most famous work is Ode to Joy, which everybody loves so much. Maybe we could even play it somehow into the we'll episode. Drop it in. Yeah, yeah, drop it in. Um, and Ode to Joy actually started out as a poem by Frederick Schiller. And, uh, and Beethoven loved this poem because it expressed like, all these ideals of love and brotherhood that were really important to him. So he labored for years. I want to say it was 30 years, maybe mm -hmm. getting that wrong, but like forever um, to set this poem to music. But during the time that he's working on it, he starts to lose his hearing and he has all these other personal troubles. Um, and by the time, by the time of the debut performance, after all these years of creating Ode to Joy, he's now totally deaf. And yet he's like desperate for 
this music to be performed the way he hears it in his head. And so he stands on stage with the orchestra with his back turned to the audience and he's facing the orchestra and he's like throwing his body around trying to direct them to play the music the way he sees it in his mind. He's, he's standing next to the conductor. Um, and because he doesn't see the, because he can't hear any of it, he doesn't even realize when the music is actually over, when they're done playing. But when it's finished, there's a 20 year old soprano and she turns him around to face the audience who are so overwhelmed. They're like standing up in their seats with tears streaming down their faces and raising their hands in tribute to this man who's given them this experience of longing, which like you, you listen to that music and it's an ode to joy. It's literally about joy. And yet you can't help but hear the longing and the sorrow that's like echoing mm. in its notes. It's, it's just the most incredible. That's what makes the music so incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, there is a, an economist at MIT whose name I'm forgetting right now, but he did this fascinating study where he looked at Mozart, Beethoven, and Liszt at their music. And he read all the different letters they had written over their lifetimes, and he coded the letters for emotions. And he found that during the periods when, they, when their letters had a lot of emotions expressed, like sorrow and longing and grief and like that, that was when they were composing their most profound, mm. best works of art. Wow. Yeah, yeah. There, wow. There's just this incredible confluence there. And I feel like we know it instinctively. Yeah. But we're not sure what to do with it. And it's hard to- we don't to, want to go deaf. It's hard you know? to like canonize right. it. Like, oh, this note and this note, it's more than that, right? Like it's the performance of the music as well. You have the story of the, the violinist, right? Like when you are carrying a certain emotional resonance, it gets translated into those notes in a certain way that we immediately recognize, but you can't quite define. And in telling that story about Beethoven, it's very cinematic. Like I imagine like yeah. he's just, you know, like doing his thing with such, you know, dramatic physicality, but because he can't hear, he's completely detached with how it's being received. And perhaps even thinking like, is this even working at all? Or am I able to kind of, get out of these musicians, the performance that I hear in my mind, only to find out that it is united and, and, and really just you know, uplifted and connected this, this huge group of people. And I think it's really profound example of the power of, of you know, sharing those types of emotions and, and, and figuring out a way to create a, a, a container for it that people can consume that really is this antidote to what is dividing us. And it's like, I don't have to tell you, like it does feel so divided out there. And mm -hmm. I often despair of our ability to kind of mend that division. And it used to be when a tragic event befell the country or the world, we would feel like one, mm -hmm. we would feel like mm -hmm. that super organism. And now it feels like when that happens, everybody retreats to their corner and figures out how to blame the other side for it. And like, how do we move forward as a functional healthy society with this sort of rift and dynamic that doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Yeah, I know. And I mean, I don't have answers any more than anybody has the answer, but I do think that one thing that we could and should be doing is creating spaces for people to truly be telling their stories, um, but to have the stories not be attached to policy prescriptions or politics or anything like that just tell each other the stories, mm -hmm. you know, like just get to know each other on that elemental level. Um, obviously like our social media platforms right now are designed to do the exact opposite right. of that. But sometimes like if we could have a social media platform that would give people space to just mm -hmm. share it all. Maybe like maybe it needs to be done anonymously. Something like yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, it is. But, Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, not everybody wants to, tell their story with a name attached the sure. way you do with the moth, but you know how- Maybe the, there's a way to anonymize it. Yeah, yeah, or, or have that option. Yeah, I think there's something about storytelling, like honest, open, vulnerable storytelling that is akin to this notion of bittersweetness and, and perhaps it emanates from the vagus nerve as well. Like when we hear somebody share a story and we have the sense that that story is true to that person and honest and authentically rendered, 
that also breeds connection, right? Yes. Like whether yeah. it's bittersweet or not, like just the storytelling as a vehicle for connection and also learning, like, like it doesn't have to be prescriptive, but it's more effective than a prescription when whatever that, that notion is, is kind of wed into the narrative. Like we as human beings are able to kind of synthesize that and then ultimately kind of uh, hold on to it and perhaps even practice it in our lives in a way that uh, is very different than if somebody said, here's the five things that you need to do today. Mm -hmm, we remember mm -hmm. the story, we forget the listicle. Um, and I think there's something really profound about that as well, that that perhaps, you know, can be traced back evolutionarily, you know, back to the, the, um, the campfires of, oh, of, yeah. of yore and, and, and the like. Absolutely. I mean, I actually think podcasts play a huge role yeah, I, in that. I, I, I think part of the reason that podcasts mm -hmm. have become the amazing medium that they are is that they're they're touching into that campfire impulse that we have. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something about the voice in your ear as you're listening where you feel like you're like bonded with all the other listeners sitting connected. around a campfire. Yeah. It's connection. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So there you go. There's your, there's your next book. <laughs> <laughs> what are you working on now? Are you on another seven year jaunt to the next one? Well, I mean, I probably will be at some point. Uh -huh. And I have two different book ideas that I'm playing with, but I actually want to start a podcast also. So I'm probably uh -huh. going to be doing that cool. in the next year. Nice. And that's going to be my next big project. Uh -oh. That's exciting. Can you yeah. say more about that? Or is that under wraps right now? It's under wraps right now, but yeah. I'll definitely let you know yeah, cool. uh, when, it, when it's ready. It probably won't be until 2023. Mm. So, so what do you? What is it that that you want people to get out of of bittersweet the most? Like, if they're if they're to take away, you know, one core idea. Um, I mean, I guess I'd say the idea of that whatever pain you can't get rid of to make that your creative offering, mm -hmm. um, and then and then another large idea I would say, and this applies to quiet as well as to bittersweet, is the idea of there being ways of being in this world that are not talked about, that are actually kind of hidden superpowers. Yeah. Because um, I, I, I hear now from so many people, like the letters that I'm getting from people who have read Bittersweet are so similar to the letters I've gotten all these years from quiet readers. Like it's all these people saying, you know, I felt this all my life and either I never had words for it or I never felt like it was okay to talk about because it's not seen as the right way to be. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, and yet there is a sense of it being a superpower once you understand it as such. Yeah. So I think it would be helpful to also share some words for um, perhaps the extroverts out there that have introverts in their lives. Like maybe they have a kid who's introverted and they're struggling to understand why this person, you know, wants to be in their room and doesn't want to go to the party or, you know, I think from a parenting perspective, I have an introverted child, a child who's very introverted and has been an education and a learning experience to like, like, even though I have introverted proclivities, I still have some extra, you know, it's sort of like, I don't want to judge my child because this is my child's choice or this is what, um, you know, this person needs to, you know, recharge the battery in terms of like how we parent and how we, think about supporting the introverts in our life. Oh yeah. I mean, there's so much mm -hmm. to say there, but I mean, the first thing as you're saying is to just really understand like where your child or spouse or whomever it is, is coming from and what do they need to be happy. Mm -hmm. um, with children, I think the fear often is that if they're not kind of out there socializing enough, that they're not gonna like get enough of the bounties that life has to offer. So one thing to know is that like the, the research shows that if your child has one or two close friends, that's what they need. Mm -hmm. Like if your kid has no friends at all, that's when you should be concerned. But if they have just a few friends and if they're happy with that, then that's fine. Um, and to, I mean, for all introverts, I, I, there's the question of if, um, if a person wants to like stay home from a party or something, is that because of a true preference of how they want to spend their time? Or is it out of a sense of fear or discomfort? Sure, right. And like with, with a child, if you think it's fear or discomfort, then that's when you can be a really helpful parent in helping them to develop strategies and work through that. But if it's just preference of how they want to spend their time, 
then you want to make sure they don't become too isolated, mm -hmm. but you also want to honor their preference. Yeah, that becomes very nuanced and difficult because <laughs> is it a preference or is it just you're afraid of trying something new? Like right. You need to get pushed a little bit out into the world and and learn new things and try things and fail and all of that to Susan David's point of emotional resilience. Like you can't procure that in a vacuum. Yeah, and the answer to that, like if you sense that it's fear or discomfort that's standing in the way, the answer to that for parenting, but also for our own selves is to expose your child or yourself to the thing that you fear, but to do it in very small steps mm -hmm. so that it's manageable and that your, so your child has small wins as right. they go. So like a lot of introverted kids, just for example, um, are a little iffy about swimming when they're first introduced. And the answer is not to like throw them in the water. It's more to say, okay, let's go to the pool on a day when it's super quiet. We'll go like late on a Tuesday evening um, and you're gonna dip your toe in the water and that's it. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna celebrate and we're gonna go home. Right. And then you go back the next day and you do a little more and a little more and a little more. And little by little, they come to love it. And then you can't tell the difference between them and the kid who just jumped in from mm -hmm. the beginning. Mm -hmm. But it's like, a lot of times introverted kids need a longer runway that they travel down before they take off and yeah. fly. And they need to know that you're with them on the runway and admiring them and respecting them as they travel that runway. Right. Yeah, that's really good advice. I like that. Um, the final thing I wanted to ask you about is this idea of of getting being so good in your particular role professionally as an introvert, but inevitably getting promoted into a role <laughs> that requires extroversion, which is the story of your life, right? Like to write this book about introversion, to be an introvert, and then to become the public facing, you know persona behind this idea and this movement have foisted you onto the public stage where now it's kind of your job to like be extroverted in public, right? And having mm -hmm. to kind of learn a new set of skills. And I think it's common probably in, in you know, less extreme examples of people who excel at their job and then suddenly they get promoted into a role that requires a completely different skill set that that is at odds with who they wanna be or what they're good at. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, the first thing I would say is that when that happens, that's really the moment when you know whether you love and care about your work or not, because it's one thing to have to go outside your comfort zone in the service of work that you love. And it's another thing to have to do it for a job that you don't actually care about that mm -hmm. much. So like, I'm really lucky. I, I care so much about what I'm doing and I love writing so much and these ideas that it's like worth it to me to go through the, the parts that are more, more of a stretch. Um, so in some ways, in, the introverts could see that as an advantage, that they're less likely to get stuck in the right. wrong job because it's just gonna be too painful at the end of the day uh -huh. when they get promoted. Um, but also, so the psychologist Brian Little talks about this a lot, the idea that in this service of work or people we care about, we can and do and should sometimes step out of character but you have to do it in a way that honors your own self and you have to give yourself lots of restorative niches mm -hmm. to come back. So like I, I do that all the time. Like when I go out on trips and I'm giving talks or interviews or whatever, I spend so much time afterwards ordering room service yeah. and just like I, chilling I in the hotel. On that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's and, like you can't wait to get back to the hotel room and be alone. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I really like honor that time um, mm -hmm. and I guard it really carefully. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also, you know, I feel like I'm lucky because I also get to spend a lot of time doing my work is just like sitting at a cafe writing. Right. So I, I do think it's worth asking oneself, like if you get to a point where your work is having you constantly doing things that are outside your comfort mm -hmm. zone, it might be the wrong place for you. But if you can get it to a manageable place and it's in the service of something you care about, mm -hmm. then it's okay. Yeah, if if you're if you being like the this public facing person on the subject of bittersweetness or introversion meant meant that 
Um, you couldn't write anymore because now you're running a large organization that's trying to foster these ideas. That probably would not be something you would want. <laughs> that would be too high of a cost. Way too right? high of a Even cost. Even if it would make you super successful and push these initiatives through and change the world, it's not within your constitution to do so. Yeah. And having that self-awareness to recognize that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, not your const- not. I feel like it's not my constitution. Yeah. It's not my calling. It's not what I feel like I should be right. doing. Um, yeah, but you no, know, I, I am super careful about that when mm-hmm. I when I go and do these public facing things. Yeah. And is it <laughs> is it non anxiety producing for you now because you're so practiced at it? So it's not like extremely anxiety producing uh-huh. anymore the way it used to be for me. Um, really not at all. I feel like I've overcome that. But I would still say that, you know, a morning in which I am looking at a day full of publicity versus a morning where I'm looking at a day full of writing with my laptop, those are completely different different mornings. Two different experiences. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe everybody feels that way. Um, But I feel like it's probably more intense. the, The difference between those two is probably more intense for me. Right. Like, I think I read actually that you, am I right about this? That you spend your mornings doing exercise and yeah, very writing pro- and very contemplative things. The first part of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And then you do podcast interviews and things like that later. Right. And when I read that, I thought that's really interesting. I don't think that would work for me because if I knew that I had the public facing side happening later in the day, I don't know that I would be able to enjoy as much uh, the writing it, it and spoils, contemplative stuff. It spoils the other stuff earlier in the day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. But it yeah. sounds like you don't experience that. Um, no, it, it, it definitely, like public speaking creates a lot of anxiety for me. Um, but like doing podcasts, less so. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something I, I, you know, I could do it in the morning too, but I just, I need that time for, that's that's a that's a recharge the battery time, right? Yeah, like if yeah. I don't recharge the battery, then when I come in to do this other stuff, like I'm just not at my best. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I have to protect that time for self-care. And that doesn't mean that I always do it perfectly or that I don't make exceptions because life intervenes and all of that. But I try really hard to like, that's, that's how I preserve you know, who I am, I mm-hmm, think, mm-hmm. the whole thing. And, and it's a privilege. Not everybody can have that. You right, know, absolutely. Thing, and I recognize that. Um, but it's pretty fundamental to kind of how I do things. Yeah, no, that makes yeah. sense. Um, and I have my, my uh, you'll appreciate this, like my home office um, is a shipping container uh, that we kitted out into like an office. So it's just like a writing office with bookshelves and things like that. And that's where I kind of can work at home. So it's customized on the inside and you know has an air conditioner and all that kind of stuff, but mm-hmm. it's literally a shipping container, right? <laughs> and when, and, and, uh, when we were kind of figuring out how to tweak it and customize it, um, the kind of contractor that we hired to like help us with this. He's like, well, you're gonna want a big window and you should do, and it should be like this, let all the sunlight in. I was like, no, I don't <laughs> want any window. Like I want it to uh-huh. be like, I literally want to have the experience of being in the womb. Like yeah, to feel yeah. like on some level, on a primal level, like that's what makes me feel safe and protected. Yeah, no, I totally know? understand. And then he still put a little window in <laughs> and then I hung a shade over it and so I could black it out anyway. I hope that uh, office designers are listening to that. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're all like, you're crazy. You're going to want this. And I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm not going to want it. All right. Well, any last thoughts for the introverts out there grappling with bittersweetness? Before <laughs> 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 we wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, I think we can wrap uh, it up. Really just to understand... Um, I don't know, just that my view of life, I don't know if I've said this already, so edit this out if I have, but- um, Lay down the truth. (laughs) My life philosophy is that there are different kinds of superpowers that exist in this world. And usually we're each only granted one or two of them. You know, and like we know this Mm -hmm. from all the movies, right? There's like lightsabers and and then there's like Spider-Man and Incredible Hulks and all these different ways of being powerful in the world. And so for people who are born with more of a, a bittersweet way of being or an introverted way of being and a sensitive way of being, these are, these are superpowers that 
where you're like in the stage of the movie, you're like Luke Skywalker before he knows that he has the force, mm -hmm. basically, because mm -hmm. your culture isn't teaching you about the superpower that you naturally possess, but it's there. It's just yours to discover. I think there's something really powerful too about <clears throat> that quiet person who is really grounded. There's a center of gravity and kind of an anchor to that person who knows who he or she is yeah. um, and is really comfortable in yes. that quiet space that is perhaps exponentially more powerful than the boisterous person who's you know really loud and perhaps charismatic, but unable to kind of um, have the resonance that you know that that quiet, powerful person can yeah, impart. Yeah, I think that's right. And like I often tell people, you know, because people are always quieter. People are always concerned about how do you show up in a meeting and still have presence, especially when everybody's you know mm -hmm. talking, being very dominant. Um, but there's a way where if you're speaking from a sense of conviction people know it, like they feel it right away and that's what carries the power. So the answer is not to try to become a louder, more dominant person. The answer is more to get in the habit of understanding what you truly believe and speak what you truly believe. And then people feel that. Mm -hmm. That's where the power comes from. There you go. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, thank you. Thank really you. Great. No, I appreciate it. Uh, the work that you do, and the wisdom that you share with the world is is really powerful. And it's obviously changing millions and millions of people's lives. And um, I think these are really important topics and subjects um, that previously perhaps we were too afraid to talk about and you've made it a thing. And I just wanted to publicly thank you for that. And oh can't gosh. wait to see, see what you do next. Well, thank you so yeah. much. And such a treat to get to meet you in person and I just, Love the work you do. So thank you. Thank you. The pleasure and the honor is mine. <laughs> so come and talk to me again sometime. I would love it. Cool. Peace. Yeah.